Hi everyone, welcome to week three, part one of ESS three in summer session one. Today we're going to be talking about ENSO, which is El Nino and uh, El Nino and La Nina in hurricanes. But I'm going to start off with a recap of upwelling and downwelling, and a little more on gyres. I know last week part of the video somehow got cut out while I was um, uploading it. So that section on upwelling and downwelling got skipped in the video that was posted for last week. So I want to make sure that I um, go over it in enough detail for you all. Um, I also left the majority of that off of test one. So I can put uh, more questions on test two about upwelling and downwelling. I didn't want to um, test you on that information when I knew that that part of the lecture was missing. So I'll start with that and then we'll get into El Nino and La Nina and hurricanes. So to start our recap, we have to remember our three cell model. So this is the model of our uh, atmospheric motion. So in the green arrows, we have our surface motion. So this is the uh, surface air motion. And then uh, the arrows along the sides here are is the vertical motion. So at our low pressures, at our warm areas, uh, we have rising motion. That rising motion creates clouds. The air then has to split in either direction, um, heads away from the equator, and sinks down as it cools. So here we have colder air sinking down. This is a um, high pressure, so it's very sunny, creating this first circulation ring. We also know at our coldest area in the poles, we have sinking air because it's so, so cold. Um, sinking air means we have clear skies. That air will hit the surface and split in either direction, heading down towards the equator. Um, eventually it starts to warm up and it will begin to rise. This middle ring here is the opposite direction of the other two because it works like a gear. So here we have sinking motion, here we have rising motion. Uh, this creates this uh, middle gear of our three cell model. So the three cell model we can also use to then look at our uh, surface winds. So the wind is going to travel from high pressure to low pressure, but it is not going to travel in a short line. If you remember, Coriolis is going to cause our air to in the northern hemisphere, um, be turned to the right. So for example, this air is moving from high pressure to low pressure, so from cooler at 30 degrees to warmer at 60 degrees. Um, here we have the air moving not straight, but actually veering to the right. Here again, we have the air is not moving straight, the arrow is veering to the right, to the right, of the direction of the motion. So you might have to flip your computer screen around, flip your notes around to see that in the direction of this motion, this arrow is to the right. Then in the southern hemisphere, it's the same but opposite. So the air is not going to go straight from high to low, it is going to be veered to the left in the southern hemisphere. So um, with that uh, atmospheric circulation, in combined with the fact that we have continents interrupting our, our oceans, uh, we form gyres. So the gyres follow along with uh, the strong wind patterns. You'll notice if I, oops, if I go back, um, at the equator we have air moving from the east to the west. Um, at around 30 degrees, uh, excuse me, at around 60 degrees, we have this air moving uh, to the east. And here you can see that at the equator, we have water moving from the east to the west. And then to the north, we have water moving to the east. So the wind patterns um, cause some of the reason for our gyres. Um, the other reason is that eventually the water hits the continent. <laughs> and that is what continues our circulation. So our wind patterns are going to push the water uh, from the east to the west across near the equator and then at higher latitudes from the west to the east. Um, due to the fact that we have our continents, that water is going to end up circulating in a circle. In the northern hemisphere, it, the circle goes clockwise. Um, in the 
southern hemisphere, it goes uh, counterclockwise. You'll notice that all the gyres in the southern hemisphere of our five main gyres, um, the subtropical gyres, they move the same direction. So here the North Pacific subtropical and the North Atlantic subtropical are both um, clockwise, while the southern subtropical gyres are counterclockwise. So here is um, the same GIF that I had uh, last week to show the actual motion of the gyres. So just to show you that the two northern subtropical gyres are clockwise, the three southern subtropical gyres are counterclockwise. Now, um, the gyres are essentially big circular, it's just circular motion of water. And it's caused by, like I was showing earlier, um, the surface winds. So here we have the dark purple showing our uh, ocean circulation. And then the lighter grayish purple and the green are showing our uh, wind. So the surface wind is going to push the uh, water in the northern part of the ocean from the west to the east. These currents down here by the equator are going to push the water from the east to the west. The water hits the continent, goes up, connects with this water being pulled by the wind, hits a continent, goes down, uh, by down I mean south, um, creating this uh, circulation here, creating those five main gyres. So this is a nice figure. You can see the ocean circulation as well as the wind circulation and really see how they work together. So the gyres, all five of these are generally circled right around, uh, centered right around um, 30 degrees latitude. They are the subtropical gyres because they are in the subtropics around 30 degrees. Um, There's sort of four different boundaries of our gyre. We say the equatorial current, the part that's closest to the equator. Um, and then we have either the northern here or the southern boundary current, so north, um, marking the other end of the gyre, either to the north or the south, depending on which um, hemisphere you're in. And then there's the western boundary current, which is the current on the west side, as well as the eastern boundary current, so the current on the east side of the gyre. So here's another figure showing all of the um, different currents specifically. So here we see the Gulf Stream, which is a strong one off the coast of um, the east coast of the U.S. Here are the uh, currents that make up the largest gyre, the North Pacific Gyre. So uh, the four main currents uh, are important because uh, they play a role in not only uh, the gyre formation and uh, keeping the gyre going, but also the climate of those regions. So the equatorial currents, those are uh, moving to the west along the equator. And then uh, the northern or the southern boundary currents are the other end. So those are the ones moving east across the ocean basin. And then the western boundary currents are usually warm water. And the eastern boundary currents are cool water. So I can go back. Whoops, excuse me. Here we go. So the western boundary current, let's use the Pacific for an example. The western boundary current is warm water because it's pulling water from the equator northwards. And then we have the uh, northern boundary current. And then the eastern boundary current is going to be pulling water from more towards the poles down to the south. So that is a cold current. So the western boundary currents, which pull water from the equator northwards, are always going to be colder. The eastern boundary currents are going to pull water southward, um, are always going to be cooler. So the currents on the west side of the gyre are actually intensified. So the center of the gyre itself is not going to be in the center of the ocean basin. So due to the rotation of our Earth, the fact that the Earth is spinning in this diagram in this direction, the center of the gyre will actually be offset. And the western side will actually be intensified. So you're going to have a stronger current on the western side of the gyre. So here the green arrows are the wind, the blue arrows are um, the ocean circulation. So the eastern side, um, it's a wider current, it's going to be slower and shallower. The 
western side is going to be a deeper, narrower, stronger current on the west side due to the fact that our earth is rotating. So the western boundary currents are maybe the currents that you have heard of before. So the Gulf Stream that's in the northern Atlantic off the coast of the U.S., uh, the eastern Australian current or the EAC, if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, you know about the EAC. Um, that's a very strong one. So these are generally the strongest currents, are the western boundary currents. They're all pulling water from the equatorial region towards the poles, so in the northern hemisphere north, in the southern hemisphere pulling water south. So they're the warm currents, but they are stronger, faster, um, and narrower. So here we have a nice graphic, a depressing graphic, but it's a good graphic of the ocean gyres of the world as it shows how um, garbage and other things get trapped in our gyres. So if we, excuse me, if we go back to this picture, we see that um, here we have our North Pacific gyre circulating clockwise. And then if you think about the Ekman transport, if the surface water is moving clockwise in this direction, that means that the uh, water column is going to be um, pushed to 90 degrees to the right. So that means that the water is actually going to be moving inwards. So we have our circulation here, but the water will um, start to pool inwards in the middle of our gyre. So the same with uh, the North Atlantic here. Here the water is going to be pushed to the right, which is inside of the gyre. In the Southern Hemisphere, here we have our counterclockwise motion, and the water is going to be pushed to the left. And here on this side, the water is going to be pushed to the left, which means it's going to converge in the middle of the gyre. So in our gyres is where we see a convergence of water. Water is going to accumulate, moving in towards the center of the gyres. So this picture is really nice because it shows you, here's that clockwise motion in the northern hemisphere, but it shows the inward spiral. It doesn't really move like this per perfect spiral. This is just a way to make the gyre look really, uh, to make the figure look really nice. But we do have that clockwise motion with the um, water moving inward. So all of the garbage, among other things, gets trapped in this gyre. Because not only is it a large circulation, but it's also pushing everything in towards the center of the gyre. Same is true in um, Southern Hemisphere. We have counterclockwise motion, but still inward motion. So um, what's happening is that that's that Ekman transport moving water to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the east, uh, to the west in the southern hemisphere, um, which means that the water is going to pile up in the middle of these gyres. So the center of your gyre is actually going to be offset. It's going to be offset towards the west. So that center of the gyre, it's not only going to be offset, but it's also going to be raised up. So something like this. We're going to have a raised sea surface in the middle of our gyre. And you'll notice that this is not um, even on either side because the raised surface is offset to the west, just like this. So these figures uh, line up here. So what that does is, as I was mentioning, the western current is going to be intensified. So the western current is faster, it is deeper, it is warmer, remember, because it's bringing water from the equator northward or from the equator southward. Um, it's also narrower. The eastern boundary current is going to be slower and wider, uh, less deep. It's going to be cooler, it's going to be much less intense than the um, very strong western boundary current. So the reason for this western boundary current intensification is due to the rotation of the Earth and Coriolis. So here is a good example where you can see the water in this situation is moving to the north on this side of the gyre, which means that, uh, I should say the surface of the ocean is moving uh, to the north. So that means that the water is going to be pushed to the right. Not quite 90 degrees, but just about. Um, the water will be pushed to the right, which is in towards the center of the gyre. So the water will accumulate in the center of the gyre. 
Center of the gyre, however, is not in the center of the ocean basin. It is offset due to the rotation of our Earth. So here we have the eastern boundary currents. Um, they're cooler, they're shallower, they're wider, and they are slower. So the less common gyres are the subpolar gyres. So our subtropical gyres are the main five. Uh, one, two, three, four, and five. And then you'll also notice there's a few other gyres shown. So here we have a subpolar gyre, subpolar gyre here, and then there's also two in the southern hemisphere. So what you might be noticing is that um, the direction of flow in the subpolar gyres is opposite that of the subtropical gyres. So this is uh, similar to the gear system like I was explaining for the three cell model. Um, as our subtropical gyre in the northern hemisphere moves clockwise, it's going to be pulling water from uh, the northern portion of the ocean down south. What this does is it uh, actually creates sort of an offshoot of this subpolar gyre. So the fact that the North Pacific gyre is, churn is turning, it's going to cause this Alaskan gyre to turn as well. Same thing in the Atlantic. So here we have our subpolar, uh, excuse me, subtropical gyre in the Atlantic, which will actually fuel one end of the subpolar gyre as this entire region of water will be moved from the north to the south, um, causing this subpolar gyre to rotate in the opposite direction. Notice that this cool current, this cool current, and this cool current, this cool current, they fit together like gears do. So, your first question of the day, do subpolar gyres circulate around an area of high or low sea level? Talking about the subpolar gyres here, take a second to try and determine if subpolar gyres circulate around an area of high or low sea level. First, we can think about the subtropical gyres, which I just explained. Um, our subtropical gyres here, the main five gyres, these circulate around an area of high sea level. Remember, the water is being pushed inward towards the center of the gyre, so we have convergence in the center of the gyre. That's why we have so much plastic accumulating in our gyres. So if we look at the um, opposite rotation, here we have, let's look at this subpolar gyre here. This subpolar gyre is in the northern hemisphere. It is moving counterclockwise. So the um, water, due to Coriolis, is still going to be pushed to the right in the northern hemisphere. So as this warmer, warmer current moves to the north-ish, the water will be pushed to the right out of the gyre. And here, as this water moves towards the south, the water will be pushed to the right, out of the gyre. So, it's going to be the opposite of our subtropical gyres. Subpolar gyres circulate around an area of low sea level because of um, the Coriolis effect pushing that water out of the gyre. We're going to, you should expect to have divergence due to the subpolar gyre, whereas we have convergence due to our um, subtropical gyres. So next we have upwelling and downwelling. So we know that upwelling is movement of deep water to the surface. Downwelling is movement of water to the deep ocean, moving down. And these can happen for five different reasons. I am going to go over each of these five next. So why do we have upwelling and downwelling? The first region, reason is due to either diverging or converging surface waters. Remember our uh, gyre situation we just went over. So when we have uh, currents converging, for example, in the center of a subtropical gyre, that means the water is going to be piling up in the center of our gyre. We don't form a mountain of water. It's going to be um, not noticeable to the eye, 
But what happens is you have extra water in the center of your gyre. That means that this water is going to flow downwards. It's going to downwell out uh, down through the center of the gyre. So when we have uh, converging surface waters, just like in the center of our subtropical gyres, we would expect downwelling, water moving down, because you have extra water here in the center of your gyre. Now in our subtropical gyre, where we have uh, diverging uh, surface water, that means that the surface water is moving away, it means you're removing water from the center of the gyre, for example. example. So water is going to come up from below to refill the water in that gyre. This is upwelling. So this divergence is causing water to come up from below. Upwelling. Uh, the next is when we have wind along a coastline. So continents can cause upwelling and downwelling just merely by existing. Uh, when we have wind, this is in the northern hemisphere, um, blowing along a coastline, and the water is moving to the right of the wind. Remember, 90 degrees to the right of the wind. That means that uh, the water at the surface is going to move, be moving away from the coastline. The water moves away from the coastline, which means that water from below is going to have to come up to replace it. So the water at the surface is moving away from the coastline, means water from below has to come up. This is upwelling. Then the opposite is when we have wind blowing in the other direction along a coastline, the uh, water is still going to move 90 degrees to the direction of the wind, but in this case our wind switched directions. So now Ekman Transport is pushing water towards the coastline. Now you're not going to flood this coastline. What's going to happen is the water will eventually hit the continent and then move down. So this pushing of the water towards the continent causes the water then to sink down. This is downwelling. So if we look at California, I know I asked this question um, last time, but I'm not sure if it was in the uh, actual lecture video that made it onto YouTube. Let's look at the coast of California. Would we expect to have upwelling or downwelling along the coast of California here? if we know that this is our uh, main wind direction. So our wind direction is moving from north to south along the coastline, which means that um, as our wind is moving, the water will be deflected to the right of the direction of the wind which means that we will have water moving away from the coastline. Away from the coastline means the water will have to be filled in from below, so we will have upwelling. Water will come up from the bottom to fill in as the surface water moves away from our coastline. In California, we have upwelling. Um, upwelling in California is quite common. It's actually um, very, very helpful because it is colder but it's also much more nutrient rich, so it helps to fertilize the ocean off the coast. So we have um, an abundance of um, life in our oceans right off the coast because the nutrients in the bottom water are able to be brought up to the surface. Uh, the temperature is also generally kept quite lower, so the ocean temperature will be cooler. This makes fog much more likely. So if you have experienced May gray or June gloom, um, this is the reason, because the ocean water is so much cooler, making fog much more likely in this region. So the third reason for upwelling and downwelling are due to bending in the coastline. So when the coastline bends, and you have uh, the green here is the uh, continent, here we have the ocean. So the red arrows are showing us the direction of ocean motion flowing from the north to the south. What this does is when we find a bend in the coastline, um, closest to the coastline here, you're actually pulling water away from the coastline. So you're pulling this water away, which means this water um, has to come up from below. You're pulling all this surface water away, meaning that water is going to have to come up from below in order to replace that ocean. So you're going to have upwelling. If we were to switch the currents, flip them in the opposite direction, so switch these arrows around, we would have water pushing towards the coastline, 
uh, water pushing towards the coastline is going to cause downwelling. You're not going to flood this area, it's just um, ocean currents, but you will have downwelling as that water um, builds up along that coastline. The fourth is due to the shape of the seafloor. So our seafloor, um, especially on that abyssal plain, it is not totally flat. There's quite a bit going on under the water. So what happens is when um, the ocean finds something like a table mount, an underwater volcano, for example, um, the water is going to be forced upwards, upwelling, so that will bring deep water to the surface just because there's something in the way. And then on the other side, you might find downwelling. This surface water will then be forced downwards. And then the last reason for upwelling or downwelling is due to the pycnocline. So the pycnocline, remember, is that um, area at the surface of the ocean where we have a very uh, steep change in density with uh, lower densities at the top, uh, steeper, uh, excuse me, lower densities at the top, higher densities at depth. This means that there's not going to be much uh, vertical motion because the water is very happy to have low density on top high density on the bottom, just like we saw in the experiment videos. Low density is going to always want to be on top, high density is going to be at the bottom. But when there is no pycnocline, that means that the water is pretty well mixed, which means it's actually going to be quite easy for there to be upwelling or downwelling because the water is going to be happy to move around. There is no um, um, set stratification like there is in the, for example, in the low latitudes. Uh, when there is no pycnocline, it makes it much, much easier for the surface water to mix with the deep water. And this is um, especially present at the high latitudes where we don't have very much of a pycnocline. So all this about our um, uh, upwelling and downwelling, but what does it really mean for us? Um, if you had to take a guess, what will be limited by the surface ocean? So here we have um, sort of the equation. In the surface ocean, carbon dioxide and water and nutrients with a little bit of light um, are able to create that organic matter and um, oxygen or also shells for the most part. Um, which part of this equation is going to be limited in the surface ocean. So limited in the surface ocean will be nutrients. So the surface ocean has plenty of carbon dioxide, takes it all from our atmosphere. Water, of course, in abundance. We're in the surface ocean, so we don't have to worry about light. We're just talking about the surface where the um, water still receives light from the sun. The limiting factor is nutrients. So what happens, we have this equation creating our organic matter and our O2. This will eventually sink to the bottom, sink to the deep ocean. Once it's in the deep ocean, we will have respiration occurring, which is where the organic matter and the O2 um, convert back into carbon dioxide and nutrients. So the nutrients are created in the deep ocean. So in order to bring nutrients up to the surface, we have to have upwelling. So upwelling brings an abundance of nutrients to the surface as well as allows for a huge amount of life. So the deeper, colder water is nutrient rich. When it is brought up to the surface, we see a huge amount of life at the surface because life is limited by that nutrient content. Um, life in the surface ocean requires uh, those nutrients that are created in the deep ocean. So when we look at a map of life in our oceans, in our surface oceans, what you'll notice is that there's very clear changes. Um, you might notice this pattern of five circular blobs in our five main ocean basins. Yes, you should be thinking about the gyres. Here we have uh, the highest life in our oceans would be in the red and the orange colors, the lowest in the dark blue and the black. So if you remember, we have convergence in the center of our gyres. So our gyres are circulating, Ekman transport, 
is pushing water towards the center. So we have convergence. That means we have downwelling. So the surface water is pushing downwards. We do not have any upwelling. Upwelling is where we bring the nutrients to the surface. So the centers of our gyres do not have very much life in the surface because there's no nutrients. All of uh, the water here is converging and then um, causing downwelling. Where we have upwelling would be in our uh, subpolar gyres as well as along many of our coastlines. You'll also notice uh, here is a subpolar gyre, here is a subpolar gyre, uh, here's the subpolar gyre, um, as well as in the Atlantic, excuse me, in the um, northern Pacific and northern Atlantic, where we have a lack of pycnocline, it's where we're going to have um, increased upwelling and downwelling. So the least amount is going to be in the center of our gyres, where we have downwelling, we will have the least amount of life. So in this picture, the red arrow, I believe this was a question on your um, quiz last week too. Since we're going over them, I figure it won't hurt to get some extra practice. The red arrow shows the motion of the surface water. So which direction is the wind blowing? This is the surface water. Which direction is the wind blowing? So the first step here would be to recognize that we are in the southern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere means that the ocean water is going to move to the left of the uh, wind. So this is ocean water moving to the left of our wind arrow. That means the wind arrow would have to be moving in this direction. So that is B. B would be uh, the correct a wind direction. And in this situation, we would have upwelling because the water is moving away from the coast, which means that the water has to come in from below to replace and refill that location. We would have upwelling. Okay, so next we're going to talk about um, ENSO and hurricanes. So here you'll learn about the different phases of ENSO, why they occur, and understand a little about how both El Nino and La Nina affect humans and ecosystems. Then we'll get into hurricanes, explain what hurricanes are, um, and be able to determine which hemisphere you're looking at when you see a picture of a hurricane. Um, we will talk about where hurricanes occur and the patterns of hurricane paths, the structure of hurricanes, and then some of the damages that are caused um, commonly along with uh, hurricanes. So ENSO stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation, which we consider to be both El Nino and La Nina. So you can have an El Nino ENSO event or a La Nina ENSO event. So it's called El Nino Southern Oscillation because we found or determined El Nino first. So we learned about El Nino, we as in the scientist community, um, learned about El Nino first before we realized there was also an El Nino um, component. So the key to understanding El Nino and La Nina is to know about the walker circulation. So the walker circulation is the circulation of the atmosphere in the equatorial Pacific. So this image here shows these solid pink lines are the atmospheric motion, the dashed pink line is the oceanic motion. So there is an east-west circulation in our atmosphere. So the air moves from the east across the Pacific to the west and it's due to uh, changes in temperature. And what this does is it also pushes our ocean water from the east to the west across the, across the Pacific. So these are what we call the normal conditions of the walker circulation. So things to notice, there's a lot going on in this figure, is we have our atmospheric motion in green. So this is vertical motion. We have 
um, air moving along the surface of the earth from the east to the west. And then we have rising air, air moving in the opposite direction up above and then sinking air. So where we have rising motion at our low pressure is where we have uh, condensation and rain. Where we have uh, sinking motion, we have a high pressure, there's clear skies. So similarly to um, how we think about our three cell model, rising motion means we're going to have condensation and rain, sinking motion, clear skies. So what that does is along our surface, we're pushing the water from the east to the west. So there is um, a slight motion of east to west across our equatorial Pacific due to this walker circulation. What that um, allows for is some upwelling here along the coast of South America. So normal situation, there's some upwelling around, along the coast of South America because the water is being pushed from the east to the west due to this walker circulation. So here is a video. Every few years, the El Nino phenomenon kicks into life in the Pacific Ocean around the equator. It can affect weather around the world, changing the odds of floods, drought, heat waves and cold seasons for different regions, even raising global temperatures. But what is El Nino and how does it happen? Firstly, we need to know what's normally happening in the tropical Pacific. This vast stretch of ocean sees consistent winds called trade winds that blow from east to west. These winds push warm water near the surface in their direction of travel, so the warm water piles up on the western side of the ocean around Asia and Australasia. On the other side of the ocean, around South and Central America, as the warmer water gets pushed away from the coast, it's replaced by cold water which is pulled up from deeper down in the ocean, a process called upwelling. This creates a temperature difference across the tropical Pacific, with warmer water piled up in the west and cooler water in the east. Warmer water adds extra heat to the air, which causes the air to rise with more vigour, and it's this rising air that creates an area of more unsettled weather, with more cloud and rainfall. That rising air in the west sets up atmospheric circulation across this part of the world, with warm, moist air rising on one side of the ocean and cooler, drier air descending on the other. This circulation reinforces the easterly winds, so this part of the world sits in a self-perpetuating state until El Nino begins. If conditions are right, tropical Pacific weather systems, or slow changes in the ocean around the equator, can set off a chain of events which weaken or even reverse the usual trade winds. With weakened trade winds, there's less push of warm surface water to the western side of the ocean, and less upwelling of cold water on the eastern side. This allows the usually colder parts of the ocean to warm, cancelling out the normal temperature difference. Because the area of warmest water moves, so does the associated wet and unsettled weather. This changes rainfall patterns over the equatorial Pacific, as well as the large-scale wind patterns. It's this change in winds which has a knock-on effect, changing temperature and rainfall in locations around the world. The main impacts are around the tropics, where you see an increase in the risk of floods in Peru and droughts in Indonesia, India and parts of Brazil. But virtually wherever you are in the world, El Nino has the potential to affect you directly via the weather or indirectly via socio-economic impacts. There's another impact from El Nino which happens because of all the extra heat at the surface of the tropical Pacific. This releases vast amounts of energy into the atmosphere which can temporarily push up global temperatures. This is why El Nino years often feature among the warmest on record. Each El Nino event is different, so the global impacts can change. You can find out more about the differing impacts of El Nino on our website. El Nino peaks around Christmas time and lasts for several months. 
it can die back to neutral conditions, but sometimes reverses into La Nina. This is the flip side of the oscillation which sees a strengthening of the normal trade winds. This pushes the warmest water to the far western part of the tropical Pacific and increases the upwelling of cold water in the east. This cooler water extends out from the coast of the Americas towards the central part of the ocean. La Nina also impacts global weather and tends to have opposite effects to El Nino. You can also see more about La Nina and its impacts on our website. So I really like that video because it shows the three dimensions and also not just the static arrows, but the motion of the arrows. Um, so that link is on that um, the previous slide if you want to go back and watch that video yourself. Um, I think it does a really good job showing you exactly what's happening. So I'll go quickly over um, that again. In case you missed something, I know it was a bit of a long video to show in class, but I thought it was good. It went over all three situations, the normal, the warm, and the cold. So the warm phase is what we call El Nino. Uh, excuse me, the warm phase is what we call El Nino. This is where the circulation, that walker circulation, switches directions. So the walker, the walker circulation switches directions and blows, as you can see from this green arrow, the wind from the west to the east. So instead of the other way around, now our circulation is blowing along the surface from the west to the east. What this does is it switches the weather pattern. So now we have rain over on um, the eastern Pacific and we have clear skies and generally a lot of drought on the western Pacific. So another big thing that this El Nino does is it is pushing our water now from the warmer area in the west towards the east. So this shuts off the upwelling that we originally or normally see along the coast here. So remember I said that ENSO stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation and we found out about El Nino first. That's because the reason that this um, circulation was studied is because there were certain times, certain years, where fishermen off the coast of the South America um, had absolutely horrible seasons. They didn't realize is that it was an El Nino event, meaning that there was no upwelling along the coast of South America. There were no nutrients being brought to the surface, which means there was um, a huge lack of fish. So the fishermen did very, very poorly. Um, they actually named this El Nino after uh, baby Jesus. So saying, if we name it after him, maybe he'll make it go away and we'll be able to fish again. So El Nino, that's where the name came from. That is why um, Enso is called El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's uh, the first part of the oscillation that we realized um, before we realized there was actually a second opposite effect. So if we look at the sea surface temperature change, so that's what this graph is here. Um, for El Nino, the warm phase, you'll notice that this is sea surface temperature anomaly, which is the change from the normal. So along the eastern side of the Pacific, right where that walker circulation is now blowing from the west to the east, we see much warmer temperatures than normal. And in the western Pacific, we see much cooler temperatures than normal. So then if we look at um, the other end of ENSO, we have La Nina. So La Nina is the cold phase of ENSO. So this is where the normal conditions are just intensified and strengthened. So we have the same uh, circulation of wind in the normal walker circulation, but it's going to be much stronger. So there's going to be much more water brought from the east to the west, that cooler water brought across to the western Pacific. There's going to be very, very strong upwelling. So the fishermen who were noticing El Nino ruining their, um, uh, their crop that year, their, how much fish they could catch, they didn't necessarily notice La Nina when there was a really great year because they weren't so upset. They were actually probably quite thrilled with all this extra upwelling because that would bring 
um, a huge abundance of fish, many, many nutrients brought up along the coast of um, South America here. So if we look again at the temperature anomalies during La Nina, it is much colder now than normal on uh, the Eastern Pacific because we have that bottom water, that cold bottom water being brought up from the bottom being upwelled to the surface. And we have uh, warm water in the uh, Western Pacific there. So La Nina is just intensifying of the normal walker circulation. So El Nino and La Nina, um, this graph shows the timing. So red is uh, the warm phase or El Nino events. The blue graph is the cold phase or La Nina. So this is from 1950 um, up until I think it's 2018. So the timing is a little strange. It lasts, like one particular phase of ENSO will last between a year and a year and a half. And on average, they occur every seven years, but it's very, it's really variable between every two to every 10 years. And the pattern is very unpredictable. So we're able to predict when an El Nino or La Nina is coming up to about a year beforehand, we can see that, um, oh, that the El Nino or the La Nina um, situation is forming. But other than that, we don't have really the ability to predict how long it's going to last, um, when it's going to come back. We don't know exactly why these events occur. We know that they occur and we know they have impacts around the world, but we don't know exactly why it starts in the first place an active area of research, I would say. Um, there are worldwide effects, uh, temperature and climate, but also on um, the life and the ecosystems. So there was a very, very, very strong El Nino in uh, 1997 to 1998 winter. Um, it killed over 2,000 people and is contributing or caused about uh, $33 billion in damage worldwide, so huge. But here you can see they made this, this is from um, an oceanography textbook, they made a really nice image here that shows you the different places around the world and the things that they experienced. So flooding, droughts, um, impacts to the bird life, to the marine life, to coral reefs, um, increased tropical storms. So you can see there's quite a bit of impact all around the world from El Nino and from um, I mean, from El Nino and from La Nina. So global temperatures are also affected. Here we have El Nino shown in, as the red dots, or the red squares. Um, La Nina is the blue squares. So El Nino is uh, the warm period. And you'll notice that the global temperatures in uh, the El Nino phase are generally warmer than average. So this red line is showing the average of the... Um, uh, El Nino. The black line shows when we're neutral in neither El Nino or La Nina. And then the blue line is showing the average of the La Nina years. So we do see um, that the global surface temperature goes up during El Nino or warm phase and it's on average lower during La Nina. You'll also notice that it is increasing over time. We'll talk more about that in week five. So there's some pretty interesting effects on California specifically. So um, this is in Newport Beach. There's a huge amount of crabs in the last um, uh, La Nina that uh, El Nino that washed up on shore. So really unusual marine life can happen when we have changes in temperatures. So this is right here in Newport. Um, would be pretty weird to walk out, uh, try to go tanning, and you find thousands of crabs. We also see there's a usually a really active um, hurricane season in the Pacific when we are experiencing El Nino. And then there's also increased precipitation in El Nino. So when we are in an in, in El Nino year, we usually see an increase in precipitation in California because uh, the jet stream actually switches. So the, pretty much the main um, atmospheric circulation in the upper atmosphere um, switches, actually moves to the south, and we will see more precipitation here in Southern California. 
So for the last part of today, we're going to talk about hurricanes. So this is um, a little joke that I found. When you hear a hurricane watch or a hurricane warning, you might get um, issued, you might get a text or one of those alerts that comes automatically on the phone because of a hurricane watch or a hurricane warning. Um, people often mix up the watch and the warning. They don't know which one is more severe. So I found this to show that a cupcake watch so when you notice, okay, you have all of these ingredients, maybe there will someday be a cupcake sometime soon because you have all the ingredients. They're even out on your counter. A warning is when you're staring at a cupcake. So a watch is when you think, hey, a hurricane might form. A warning is there's a hurricane, you better watch out. So a hurricane, what is it? Essentially, it's a really, really strong tropical storm. So a tropical cyclone, if the winds, the sustained winds are over 120 kilometers per hour, excuse me, um, we deem it a hurricane. So it has to reach sustained winds of 120 kilometers per hour to become a hurricane. Um, a hurricane is the same thing as a cyclone, which is the same thing as a typhoon. They're just in different ocean basins. So in the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific, sort of by the US, um, we call the storms hurricanes. In the Western Pacific, they're called typhoons. And in the Indian Ocean and near Australia, they're called cyclones. But they are the same storm. It's the same thing. Um, they just have different names depending on where you are. So for the rest of this class, we will just call them hurricanes. So they're generally, they can be about 600 kilometers wide. So the width of the storm. Um, they have incredibly low pressure at the center of the storm, which we call the eye. And that creates very, very, very strong winds. And these storms will last several days, um, usually even over a week. So how do hurricanes form? Uh, they start with what we call a tropical disturbance. So a tropical disturbance is um, any type of thunderstorm. It's usually multiple thunderstorms that occur at the same time. Um, and if we're talking about the Atlantic hurricane season, the thunderstorms are occurring off the coast, like here in Africa. Uh, the wind then brings the storm across the ocean towards the U.S., towards Central America, towards the Caribbean. Um, as that storm intensifies, it will go from a tropical disturbance, which is when you hear there's a tropical disturbance, that means, okay, there was a storm off the coast of Africa, it might get stronger, this might become a hurricane, but totally not sure yet. As it strengthens, it strengthens into a tropical depression, which then will strengthen into a tropical storm before it come, becomes a hurricane. So remember, a hurricane is when we have sustained winds of 120 kilometers per hour. So the hurricane, uh, excuse me, the tropical disturbance, tropical depression, tropical storm, um, needs a lot of warm water to strengthen. So it needs open space and it needs warm ocean water. So when this ocean water is warm, is where you're warmer, um, that's when you're going to have um, intensification of these storms to intensify to a hurricane. So um, to look at hurricane intensity, we look at what we call the Saffir-Simpson scale. So there's category one through five of hurricanes. A category five is the strongest uh, Hurricane category one is the weakest of the hurricanes. So stronger than a tropical storm, but it is not much more than 120 kilometers per hour. So the scale is based on wind speed. So sustained wind speed is what controls whether or not it's a category one, two, three, four, or five. And then the damage here is an example of what you might see with a category one. For example, you might see minor damage to buildings, whereas a cam uh, category two has stronger winds. Um, you might find uh, ma roofing materials and window damage, trees will be blown down. Whereas a category five is going to cause something more like complete collapse of uh, buildings, shrubs and trees, and signs blown down, and a significant amount of flooding with the Category 5. So the structure of a hurricane is uh, really, really interesting. Um, again, if you're more interested in, or if you're interested in learning more about 
uh, the atmosphere and storms, I really suggest you take ESS5, the atmosphere class. You spend a lot more time looking at weather and predicting weather and um, severe storms. So it's a really fun class. But I'm glad you're all in this one for now. So hurricanes um, spiral inwards, and they are um, essentially a very, very, very strong low pressure system, meaning that there's very, very, very low pressure at um, the surface in the center of the hurricane. So the air is spiraling inwards. That inward um, uh, convergence of air meets in what we call the eye, and then the air moves up. So what happens is we end up with a picture that looks something like this. Um, we have the structure of a hurricane. It has what we call spiral bands. So it will have sort of um, arms. So here we can see an arm of very, very cloudy skies. Here's another arm of very, very cloudy skies. This is a pretty big hurricane. The eye is that really um, dark and generally it's totally clear, no clouds um, in the center of the hurricane. So if we're looking at the hurricane from the side, whereas this is the surface and this is the top, which is this view from the top, um, we see that the eye in the center is very clear. We also notice that there's going to be no rainfall, so very low on the rainfall graph, incredibly low on the pressure graph, so that's why I was saying this storm is has very, very, very low pressure in the middle um, at the eye, and also very, very low wind. So in, in the eye of the storm, if you've heard of the eye of the storm, the calm of the storm, that's because in the eye of a hurricane, you have no rainfall, you have... Um, uh, no wind. But the most dangerous part of the hurricane is right on uh, surrounding the eye, which is called the eye wall. So really the, the band of clouds all the way around the eye is usually the scariest part. Um, if you've lived through a hurricane, this is where you're going to have the highest amount of rainfall. You're also going to have a huge change in pressure between outside of the storm towards the very low pressure of the eye, which means you're going to have very, very, very strong winds. So the strongest winds are generally right um, outside of the eye of the storm due to this change in pressure. So right outside the eye of the storm in the eye wall, you'll have the highest rainfall and the highest winds. You will experience other bits of rainfall as um, the other spiral bands were to move over you as the storm moves. If we're talking about you um, living through a hurricane. So if we look at the uh, pattern that hurricanes leave, the pattern that hurricanes generally take, um, the pattern on Earth is caused by the temperature of the ocean, Coriolis, and something we call wind shear. So I'm going to go over those three things. But you'll notice that we have uh, hurricanes, typhoons, and cyclones, all labeled here because they are all the same type of storm, um, and the intensity scale. So the orange lines show the path of very intense storms. Um, the blue show tropical depressions. The teal show um, tropical storms. So they are some really, really, really strong very intense uh, typhoons here in the Western Pacific. You'll also notice that a lot of storms occur in the same place and take very similar tracks. And that is because of uh, Coriolis, our wind patterns and ocean temperatures. So first, if we look at ocean temperatures, I did mention this before, but hurricanes need um, warmth. So they need uh, warm water. So the hurricanes are actually driven by latent heat. So remember, we learned about latent heat as um, water changes phase. Hurricanes are driven by the latent heat of water vapor condensing. So warm and very, very moist air that's provided by warmer oceans allow for hurricanes to thrive and hurricanes to um, intensify. So hurricanes need warm ocean temperatures. They need the moisture and the warmth in order to intensify and also in order to um, continue to not fall apart. Um, the next thing is the Coriolis forest. So there's no Coriolis forest right at our equator. 
because um, it's too weak at the equator. So as the um, hurricanes or as the storms begin to move, they will actually all end up turning. And you'll notice that in the northern hemisphere, they turn to the right. In the southern hemisphere, they turn to the left. This is due to Coriolis. So in the northern, in North America, or you might be most familiar with hurricanes, those that make landfall are generally along the east coast in the Gulf. They move across the ocean from Africa, and then they turn. So for the most part, um, they turn right around the Caribbean, around the east coast. Sometimes they turn before making landfall. Sometimes they make it all the way through the coast and uh, make landfall more towards the center of the um, country. But you'll notice that it's the same for the typhoons in the western Pacific, that um, those hurricanes are going to turn to the right. In the southern hemisphere, uh, the cyclones turn to the left. And then wind shear is something else that's really important. So wind shear is when we have wind moving in opposite directions at opposite height levels. So wind at the surface moving in one direction, wind um, way up in the atmosphere moving in another direction will actually destroy a hurricane because hurricanes are very, very tall. So here is um, the cartoon showing here's the eye. This is the eye wall on either side where you're going to have really high winds and really high rainfall. What happens is if at the surface, the storm is being brought one way at, um, well, I should show you this one. The surface, when the wind is bringing the storm in one direction, and then in the upper atmosphere, it's pushing the storm in the other direction, it's actually going to break the storm apart. So a high wind shear is going to break your storm apart. In order to have, um, a long life of a hurricane and a hurricane to be intensifying, we need to have very little wind shear. So wind shear at a minimum is going to allow for the storm to continue. High wind shear, where these winds are strong and in opposite directions, it's going to break the storm completely apart. So some common damage associated with hurricanes. Um, high winds, really, that's the main one. There's always high winds associated with hurricanes. We know because hurricanes are defined by a certain strength of wind. Um, we can expect damage to trees and structures there. Uh, tornadoes. So tornadoes can occur when the hurricane makes landfall, when it moves over land. If it's a really bad hurricane, we can see tornadoes. Um, very, 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 very heavy rain is also associated with hurricanes. Remember, they thrive on that um, warm ocean water. So there's a lot of moisture in that hurricane. There can be severe, severe flooding. Um, and then as well as storm surge. So storm surge is one of the most devastating things that occurs along the coastline as the hurricane is making rainfall. So this is a picture from um, the Bahamas, Hurricane Dorian last year, 2019. So um, here is a picture of a hurricane, and it is moving towards um, the Gulf Coast of the U.S. Which side of the hurricane do you think will see the largest storm surge? Which means which side of the hurricane is going to push the most water onto the coast? Take a second to try and guess, looking at the way the arrows are drawn in this figure. So what you'll want to notice when you're looking at uh, hurricane storm surges is the hurricane is moving towards the coast. So we have some motion towards the coast. However, the rotation is uh, going to move. It's the, hur the rotation of the hurricane is going to combine with the overall direction and speed of the hurricane motion. So here we have uh, the hurricane is spiraling in this direction. You can see from the nice cartoon of the clouds. So on the east side of the hurricane, we have um, motion towards the coast due to the rotation of the storm. The rotation of the storm is moving, that would be the red arrows, is moving towards the coast. That is going to be added to the fact that the hurricane itself is moving towards the coast. 
on the west side of the storm, we see that the hurricane itself moving towards the coast still. However, in this case, the rotation caused by the storm itself is moving away. So the net wind is actually going to be motion away from the coast combined with motion of the whole storm moving towards the coast. So the net wind will be quite small. On the other side, you're adding these two things together. The wind on the side of the hurricane from the rotation combined with the motion of the actual hurricane moving towards the coast, the net wind's going to be quite strong. So this side is going to bring significantly more water up and over the coast in what we call storm surge. So the largest storm surge will be on the east coast here. So the wind-driven storm surge is because the hurricane winds will pile water near the coast. So this is going to be pushing a huge amount of water towards the coast, much more and in, at a much faster rate than something like downwelling could offset. So in this case, we do flood up over the coastlines. So here are um, two storm examples. Hurricane um, Katrina in 2005 was a Category 5. Um, it was a Category 3 when it first made, land, uh, made landfall in the Caribbean. Um, it got up to a Category 5 in the Gulf. Um, it was super catastrophic for uh, Louisiana. Uh, about $81 billion in damage. Um, a Category 4 cyclone in 2008 here. Um, it made landfall as a Category 3, and it did strengthen to a Category 4. It had about a 12-foot storm surge. Here in, um, with Katrina, it had a 25-foot storm surge. I'm still not sure about um, the death toll on this storm, but it's estimated to have cost about $10 billion in damage. So I have a, a news clip from that storm that's pretty interesting. She does a great job explaining what's going on. It's not unusual for a tropical cyclone to form in the northern Indian Ocean this time of year, but Cyclone Nargis will be remembered as one of the region's most deadly storms. When low pressure formed in the Bay of Bengal on April 27th, conditions were ripe with warm waters and definitely low vertical wind shear that created an environment ripe for development. Eventually, the storm exploded in intensity with winds topping 200 kilometers per hour. It was obvious that landfall was imminent, and it happened on May 2nd in the lower section of Myanmar. Topography around this region was key to why we saw so much death and devastation. Storm surge, the leading killer in cyclones and hurricanes around the world, really unfortunately set itself up for disaster. Take a look at the reason why. On Google Earth, you can see numerous inlets through this Irrawaddy Delta region. As the water pulled in, it really had no place to go but pile high, over 600 millimeters of rain in this area. Another factor was a shallow continental shelf, meaning the land beneath the sea was shallow. So, unfortunately, that allows the storm surge to really build. If we had a deeper slope, it would have blocked that storm surge, but in this case, the water just piled straight on into the land. And this is a region that's quite populated. Take a look at this. You're talking about people per square kilometer. Over a thousand people per square kilometer live in this delta region. That's illustrated here by the darker colors you see on this graphic. So the path went right through a very populated region and the results are just devastating. Take a look at this picture back in March of 2004 for southern Myanmar and then see what it looks like now. Just this picture was now taken on May 5th and you can see the floods coming up the delta all the way across this area, indicated by the brown colors you see on the screen. So devastating floods and storm surge after tropical cyclone Nargis worked its way through Myanmar. With a special look at this cyclone, I'm meteorologist Bonnie Schneider. This is a very devastating storm, um, as was Katrina. It's not on... Oh, here we go. Um, so when we think about hurricanes, we might start thinking about the future of hurricane activity. Um, so far, there's really no agreement in um, future prediction models about whether hurricanes will become more frequent. Um, it is more agreed upon that the hurricanes will become more intense. So it's not so much that we're going to have many, many more hurricanes. It's that the hurricanes we have will be much more intense. And that's because the ocean water is warming. So with um, global warming, we see that our surface ocean is warming. That extra warmth is just more fuel for those hurricanes. 
So it's not so much that we're expecting with future warming to have more hurricanes, but we do expect them to be much, uh, much stronger. And we are expecting um, rising sea levels. So sea levels are currently rising. They're expected to rise significantly more um, in the coming centuries. This means that there's even more water to be moved by the hurricane. So storm surges would um, uh, get potentially worse if the storm is stronger and there's more water closer to the communities, closer to um, the coastlines, we would expect the consequences of these storms to get much, much worse. These two pictures are from Hurricane Sandy in 2012. This is the entrance to a subway. Um, the subway system was completely flooded in quite a bit of New York City due to that very, very bad storm. So that is what I have for you uh, today for week three, part one. Um, week three, part two on Thursday, we will talk about tides, waves, and coastlines. Um, remember, there's no discussion meeting this week on Tuesday. We will meet for discussion this week on Thursday. So I will see you all on Zoom on Thursday at 1030. And have a good one.